Hi guys and welcome to IGCSE Success. This is going to be a really, really short intro. Um, apologies if the audio is slightly off. I cannot find the connector for my mic anywhere. But if you are sitting your exams in the May-June series and you need a little bit of extra help, I do recommend watching this video, watching parts of this video, watching the whole video. It is a very, very lengthy video, but I recommend you downloading the resources, grabbing your notebook, grabbing a coffee, whatever beverage you need to get you through the whole video because it's really, really going to help. So again, best of luck for your upcoming exams and enjoy the video. And if you do have any questions, feel free to drop a comment below or email me at igcsesuccess1 at gmail.com. Hi guys, so the paper I'm going to be sitting live, wish me luck, and taking you through today is the 0513 paper from the October-November 2020 series. As always, I will link the resources in the description box below. And if you've already completed this paper independently, it still might be worth watching parts of this video just to ensure you know the correct approaches to each question, particularly if your exam is coming up in the May-June series. I will be answering live and typing my answers on a document, so if the typing annoys you, I'm sorry about that, there's not much I can do. And lastly, this video will no doubt be incredibly lengthy and may even go past two hours, as this will be my last walkthrough, probably of the year. I really wanted to dissect each question and every question and provide useful commentary. And with all that being said, let's start today's torture, or should I say paper. So of course questions 1a to e are some of the newer questions from the paper and they require you to read the first text, text A. I think the most important thing to note with all of these newer questions, well there's a few things actually. First of all you need to I guess take note of the command verb used at the start of each question. So is the question asking you to give information, identify information, explain, etc. I might be inclined to actually highlight the command verb used. Another thing, of course, is to take note of how many marks a question is worth. You'll notice that some questions, you may need to include two correct answers for one mark. Blame Cambridge, not me. Others, others may require you to include three things for three marks, a mark per correct point. Lastly, and particularly with these newer questions, overly long answers are really not necessary. Cambridge are testing your reading skills, and in most cases, they want a precise answer. So now we're ready to read text A, and of course, feel free to mute this video now if you don't want to listen to me read and you want to read it for yourself. Don't worry, I won't be offended. So text A is titled Space Travel. Humankind is becoming increasingly interested in space travel. This offers both challenges and rewards. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong's words broadcast to the world as he stepped onto the moon in 1969 became a defining phrase of the 20th century. They mark the first time a human being stood on a world other than planet Earth. The desire to go to space is as old as humanity, although the sun and moon were often characterised as gods by ancient civilizations. Others saw them as places we might dream of visiting. Many writers use their imaginations to step off Earth, usually in order to reflect humorously on its inhabitants. Improbable narratives of trips to the moon include True History by Lucian of Samoseto, 2nd century, and Edgar Allan Poe's The Unparalleled Adventure of One Hans Fall, 1835. Despite fictional excitement, many longed to learn the truth. By the start of the 20th century, technology was catching up with literary imagination, and a trip to the moon was no longer just a flight of fancy. However, since the last lunar landing in 1972, no missions beyond a low Earth orbit have included human life on board. In 1977, the Voyager probes were sent on exploration past the planets of the solar systems and out into the deep space. More recently, robotic probes have landed on Mars and even on a comet at the end of 2014. Humans, however, 
have been all but grounded. Spaceflight is prohibitively expensive. A round trip to Mars would cost billions of dollars and require humans to spend at least eight months in space, probably a lot longer, depending on what technology was available. Although NASA has provisional plans to begin safe human missions to Mars in the mid-2030s, human space travel may depend on private enterprise rather than government cash. Whether by public or private means, it seems the will is there for humans to have more than just a second-hand understanding of life on Mars. It is a daunting challenge, but so was flying to the moon in 1969. And how motivational it is too that a human footstep on another world may well become the defining moment of the 21st century. And then we've got a very short glossary there, how nice of Cambridge defining the word probes, meaning spacecrafts with no humans on board. So let's take a read of the first question. Question one, strand A. <laughs> there are lots of strands to this new paper, guys. So question one A says, give two examples of the ways in which the sun and moon have been viewed according to paragraph two. Now, fingers crossed, this shouldn't cause too many problems. It's using the command verb give. So we just need to find two explicit ideas. When rereading or skimming the text, note that the questions will take you through the text. So with question one, we are looking at paragraph two. So quite early on in the text. And there are, of course, two bullet points, so short answers are absolutely fine, and you need to get both bullet points correct to get one mark. Yes, Cambridge are that mean. So remember, we are looking for two ways in which the sun and moon have been viewed. Let's quickly read the paragraph again. It's only small. So the desire to go to space is as old as humanity. Although the sun and moon were often characterized as gods by ancient civilizations, others saw them as places we might dream of visiting. Have a think about the two answers. So with any luck, you were able to identify the first one as being characterized as gods and the second one being places we might dream of visiting. And there are my two answers for my one mark. So let's move on to 1bi. Now things get a little bit more difficult, so it's imperative you approach the question correctly. First of all, take note of the command phrase using your own words. I cannot stress this enough. There are four marks here if you manage to get both strands correct. You don't want to be chucking marks away. Now there are really two approaches here. You can explain the phrase in its entirety or you can simply explain both words in the phrase. Sometimes my students find this easier. So going with the latter for this video, you need to think of two suitable synonyms for each word in the strand. So you need to think of a suitable synonym for reflect and of course a suitable synonym for humorously. And it's always worth double checking the phrase within the given context. You are given the line number, but just to speed things up. Um, and I'm sure you are aware of what reflect humorously means without having to check. But feel free to if you are doing this paper along with me. So the verb reflect, of course, means to consider something, to contemplate something, to think carefully. I don't think Cambridge would accept the verb think on its own, so just be careful. And the obvious answer for the second strand, humorously, the adverb, would probably be amusingly. So I'm probably just going to substitute humorously for amusingly, and this is how we write it. So quite simply, we are going to put reflect equals consider and humorously equals amusingly. Notice how consider amusingly makes complete sense as a substitute and the words are within the sort of same word class, I guess. So moving on to B's second strand, the phrase is improbable narratives. Of course, this could prove difficult if you don't know what improbable means, but hopefully 
uh, you know that it denotes something which is unlikely to happen. Not impossible, unlikely. So I'm simply going to put improbable equals unlikely. And of course a narrative or narratives are stories or tales. So I'm going to put narratives equals stories. And there are four easy marks, providing you know what the words mean. Um, for this paper, I don't think they're too challenging. Okay, so 1C is asking us to reread paragraph 4. Again, note how we are being guided through the text to assess our reading skills of the entire text. Again, notice the bullet points and the command verb being to give an answer. Remember, you want to avoid overly long answers for these type of questions. Cambridge, as mentioned, are looking for exact, precise answers most of the time. And something which I forgot to mention is with these bullet point uh, questions or when it's asking you to give information, you can quote or you can change the wording slightly. That's up to you. But it's not asking you to provide an answer completely in your own words. That comes a little bit later on. So for this question, we need to give two reasons why space travel became more likely in the 20th century. Let's reread paragraph four. So paragraph four reads, despite fictional excitement, many longed to learn the truth. By the start of the 20th century, technology was catching up with literary imagination and a trip to the moon was no longer just a flight of fancy. So two answers which certainly would be acceptable would be the fact that many wanted to learn the truth and that technology was catching up or advancing. So the answers that I've put down are that people wanted to know the truth and that technology was advancing. Again, it's up to you whether you quote or change the word slightly. That's, as I mentioned, completely up to you. I personally think changing the wording slightly shows a better understanding. If you quote, what students tend to do is that they quote overly lengthy material and some of it is not relevant. So you risk throwing away valuable easy marks. So moving on to 1DI, gosh, so many strands. This is where we are being asked to reread paragraph 5 and 6. Certainly the first strand should not cause too many problems. Again, two bullet points, a mark for each bullet point this time. So given that it's asking us to identify two reasons, this question is assessing both our understanding of explicit and implicit ideas. So the answers may not always be as obvious. So we are looking for or we are trying to identify two reasons for why probes have been an advantage to space travel. Let's just read these paragraphs again just because there are two. So, however, since the last lunar landing in 1972, no missions beyond a low Earth orbit have included human life on board. Hmm, well, we need to find out the answer to that because that will no doubt be one of our answers. In 1977, the Voyager probes were sent out on exploration past the planets of the solar system and out into deep space. That potentially is one of our answers. More recently, robotic probes have landed on Mars and even on a comet at the end of 2014. Humans, however, have been all but grounded. Space flight is prohibitively expensive. A round trip to Mars would cost billions of dollars. That is definitely one of our answers and require humans to spend at least eight months in space, probably a lot longer, depending on what technology was available. Although NASA has provisional plans to begin safe human missions to Mars in the mid-2030s, human space travel may depend on private enterprise rather than government cash. So the first thing I've highlighted is that space flight is prohibitively expensive. So of course the implication here is that by using probes, it is indeed far cheaper than sending humans. And the an other answer I've highlighted is the fact that using probes allows exploration past the planets of the solar system and out into deep space. So of course that is a, another advantage. 
So quite simply for my two marks, I have put down that it is cheaper than sending humans and they can explore past the planets of the solar system and deep into space. Remember these overly lengthy sentences are not required, just two bullet points, the shorter the better. So for the next strand, we are being asked to explain why humans have not so far been to Mars. Important to note is that the question is worth three marks. As such, you are, of course, required to include three different things. As this question is asking you to explain, you may wish to use some of your own words or more of your own words to develop your explanation, although this is not necessarily a requirement a requirement you are also welcome i guess to write a mini paragraph is if that's what you are used to doing so we need to find three different ideas which link to the idea as to why humans have not so far been to mars important to note is that this question is another one which assesses your understanding of both explicit and implicit ideas Certainly one explicit idea, i.e. an idea which is clearly stated in the text, is that humans so far have not been able to go to Mars due to how expensive the trip would be. And of course they would have to spend at least eight months, if not longer, in space. So I've just highlighted those two explicit ideas. Now one implicit idea, i.e an idea which is not clearly stated. If I just read this explicit idea again, humans would have to spend at least eight months in space. Okay, what could we infer from that? Well, hopefully, you can see that there would no doubt be massive safety concerns over sending people to Mahas for at least eight months, if not longer. So that could be another idea. So as you can see, I have written a really simple paragraph and I've used those connective firstly, secondly, lastly, just to help organize my ideas. Firstly, one reason is perhaps down to how expensive the trip would be. Secondly, humans would have to spend at least eight months in space. Lastly, this could potentially lead to massive safety concerns over sending people to Mars for so long. And that is my implicit ideas. And fingers crossed that would be enough to get my three marks. Now, 1E is worth three marks and it does require you to use your own words. Absolutely no lifting from the text. Again, three marks as mentioned. Make sure you don't throw these marks away. Three different points for your three marks. The question 1E, which is the last stranded question for 1E, we have to reread paragraph seven. Using your own words, explain why there is a good chance that humans will land on Mars in the 21st century. So let's just quickly read this paragraph again. So whether by public or private means, it seems the will is there for humans to have more than just a secondhand understanding of life on Mars. It is a daunting challenge, but so was flying to the moon in 1969. And how motivational it is to that a human footstep on another world may well become the defining moment of the 21st century. Okay, so the paragraph begins with whether by public or private means. That is very much alluding to their, hopefully, I guess, uh, there being funding in place to bring this to fruition. And that's certainly one idea we could use. It also mentions, uh, is there for humans to have more than just a secondhand understanding of life on Mars? So there's very much this strong desire for people to not have a secondhand understanding or experience of Mars through textbooks, through the internet, etc., but to have the opportunity, I guess, to first hand or to have a first hand experience of Mars. And another idea seems to be that people seem ready for a challenge. It says here that it is a daunting challenge, but so was flying to the moon in 1969. So to an extent, this question is very much assessing your understanding of being able to read between the lines using those inferential skills. So if I was doing this paper for real, these are the quotes that I would highlight. Remember, we now need to take these quotes, put them into a mini paragraph, 
and ensure that we use our own words where appropriate. So here is a mini paragraph, again using those discourse markers, firstly, secondly, lastly. Let's take a read. Firstly, there is a strong desire for people to at least have the opportunity to have a first-hand experience of Mars. Secondly, there will hopefully be funding available to bring landing on Mars to fruition. Lastly, it seems that people are ready for a challenge. After all, man has already landed on the moon. Three things, make sure they are expressed in your own words where appropriate. Uh, now we move on to the dreadful summary question. <laughs> and I say dreadful because in actual fact, it's quite a difficult question to get right. It's worth 50 marks. It's the first core question. You really, really need to get the core questions right. Um, there's this sort of ignorance um, for whatever reason that shrouds this question, that it's somehow an easy question. Of course, I mean, all of the questions are easy if you know the correct approach. However, I think with a summary question, there's lots of things you need to remember, certainly if you are aiming for a top ban response. So as mentioned, there are 50 marks available. There are 10 marks allocated to reading and five marks for writing. Essentially, what you need to do is that you need to identify and select a range of ideas applicable to whatever the focus of the question is. Successful summaries always show, and I can't stress this enough, always show evidence of clear planning. You need to think carefully about what evidence you are going to use and the order in which you are going to include them. I would strongly not encourage you to adopt this I guess, chronological approach when answering the summary question. You need a range of ideas, so seven plus is absolutely fine. You need to number them on your paper and you need to think carefully about how you are going to organize them. Thinking about how you could possibly group similar things together using appropriate complex sentence structures. Remember, this is the only question which clearly stipulates that you must not write more than 120 words. So it's really important you organize your ideas, you think about how you're going to write your summary. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to include enough words, um, enough words, enough ideas in your summary without, of course, going massively over the word count. And you don't want to do that because a summary by its nature is a concise piece of writing. With all that being said, let's read the question. So question one is the first question where you have to read the new, the, the new text, text B, and that is titled The Human Swan. And the question reads, according to text B, what were the challenges that Sasha Dench experienced during her journey? You must use continuous writing, not note form, and use your own words as far as possible. Your summary should not be more than 120 words. And then, of course, you've got the mark allocations at the bottom. So this is actually quite a nice summary task because you are just being asked to summarize one strand. And that's the challenges that Dench faced during her journey. Sometimes Cambridge like to ask you to summarize two different things. And you just need to think carefully about splitting the ideas between the two strands. However, for this particular task, we just need to find seven plus ideas which link to the question. Seems quite straightforward. So let's have a read of text B titled The Human Swan. The British conservationist and human swan, Sasha Dench, travelled in a motorised paraglider or a paramotor as part of a 7,000 kilometre journey. She was following migrating Buick swans from Russia to Britain in order to better understand the reasons for their declining numbers. The whole way I've been trying to put myself in the head of a swan. There are times when I wish I was a swan. It would have been so much easier, reflected Dench. When the temperatures got really cold, I wish I could flap my arms and generate some heat, but that would make the whole paramotor shake. With her, art, with her swan's eye view of the world, Dench said that she particularly appreciated crossing the uh, tiger forests of Russia, seeing no trace of human habitation and witnessing the scale of the tundra. The colours of the tundra are the most beautiful I've seen in a the landscape. They look as if they could be from Mars, she said. 
When she reached urbanization, she met Russian school children who were sent out to shoot migrating birds for food. They were riveted by how conservation and research works, they had no idea where the swans went. Although she took care to avoid disturbing other migrating birds, there were moments when they joined her, when she flew up to 900 meters above the clouds, the sky was filled with geese. She really felt in the thick of migration, she said. At one point, two white-fronted geese veered towards her. I was just about to turn away thinking there would be a collision when they suddenly flew alongside my wingtips in a V formation. That was very special, she said. On another occasion, she flew 50 meters below a migrating Sorry, 50 meters below a migrating flock of Buick swans. They drew right alongside me. I didn't look like a threat to them. I was just a big flying thing and they completely ignore me, she said. Low points included time spent in a Russian hospital for a MRI scan following a dislocated knee during takeoff. She also lost track of one of the satellite tagged swans she was following during foul weather in Estonia. Dench realized it had perished. You get quite attached to them as individuals, she said. Although flying low over the tiger forest was particularly hazardous with its lack of safe landing spots, crossing the English Channel was Dench's toughest challenge. When I crossed from Belgium into France and first saw the white cliffs of Dover, I started to cry, she said. I'm not much of a softy, but I thought, actually, I'm keen to be home. So remember that the question is asking us to identify any challenge challenges that Sasha Dench faced. And I know I mentioned this briefly, but I'll just mention it again. The summary question asks you to write 120 words. Yes, there are 10 reading marks, but trying to include 10 things and sticking to that 120 word limits is actually quite difficult. It used to be a case, if you look back at all the papers, you had to bullet point the ideas first in note form, and then you had to include all of those ideas. That is no longer the case. So as long as you include a range of ideas, seven plus is okay. But the more ideas you have, the harder it is going to be to include all of those ideas into a concise 120 word summary. So of course, if you had this printed, you would have your highlighter ready and you would highlight all the things that are applicable to the question. And the first thing that of course stands out to me as being particularly challenging is the fact that the journey was a 7,000 kilometer journey. If that's not difficult in this paramotor, I don't know what is. And just to speed things up, I'm just going to pause the video now and I'm just going to highlight a range of ideas. So as you can see, I have highlighted a range of ideas. The first one being, of course, as mentioned, it was a very long journey. The other challenge, perhaps, that she had to think like a swan, the adverse weather conditions, the fact that she was doing all this in a kind of flimsy motorized paraglider. If you don't know what these are, <laughs> I recommend you Google them. I personally wouldn't do it. Hats off to her. Of course, she had to uh, or felt compelled to stop and educate these Russian school children about shooting migrating birds for food. Um, there was the sort of challenge of trying to not disturb other migrating birds. There, of course, was a short stint spent in a Russian hospital. Um, there's the sort of emotional challenges that came with the journey. Uh, getting close to the, the birds and then realising that the satellite tagged swan had perished. And there are quite a few others in the text as well. So what I'm going to do now is just copy and paste uh, these quotations uh, onto my document and then I'm going to think about how I'm going to organise them. Because as mentioned, you don't want to necessarily uh, adopt a chronological approach. What I mean by that is that you don't necessarily want to start at the top and work your way through to the last quotation, which is that Sasha got uh, quite attached to them as individuals. So as you can see, I've just got my quotations uh, onto my document and I'm now going to think about a sensible way to group ideas together, i.e. the order in which I'm going to include them in my summary. Um, usually I do start by adopting a chronological approach, but not always. So 
For this summary, at least, I am going to start with the journey being particularly challenging because it was a 7,000 kilometer journey. So I'm just going to put a number one by that. And looking at the quotations now, I'm going to try and, and I say try, I'm going to try and link ideas one to four together. So I think for now, I'm going to, and again, you can change this. It's absolutely fine. It makes more sense when you begin writing. I think I'm going to keep the second quotation as number two, the adverse weather conditions as number three, and the fact that she was doing all of this in a kind of flimsy motorized paraglider is pretty audacious. So I'm going to keep them in order and it will make sense, I think, when I start writing it. As for number five, I think in my head this works anyway. I'm going to put number six as number five, disturbing other migrating birds, but also the sort of challenge of there being uh, the potential to collide with the birds. And then definitely it makes sense, I think, to to explore the fact that she developed quite close bonds with the birds. So I'm going to put that as number six. And then number eight, I'm going to include that as number seven. And then I think educating me, the last two are kind of odd ones out, which don't really link with anything. So I'm going to put number five as number eight sorry about the formatting and then the fact that she had to go to hospital as the last point so i'm going to try and include nine points in a 120 word summary wish me luck okay so the first thing once you've got to this stage is to think about your topic sentence the sentence which opens up your paragraph and you want to include keywords from the question so you want to include Sasha's name and of course you want to include that keyword challenges. So a clear topic sentence would look something like this. Dench's, uh, Dench's journey to find out more about the Buick swans and their significant decline in numbers did not come without its challenges. And then of course you would use your first discourse marker. I would simply use firstly, remember there are five marks for writing, so you want to produce something which is formal, which has a suitable style, etc. Now, apologies um, if you get annoyed by the typing, but certainly for the core questions, I think it's quite important that I do it live with you and you kind of sort of uh, hear my thought process. So let's do this, starting with the first quote, which of course is 7,000 kilometer journey. We wouldn't need to um, reword that necessarily. So I would be inclined to start like this. So firstly, the seven, let's put the 7,000 kilometer journey required Dench to, notice how I'm using the surname as well, just because words are so precious with this question. Firstly, the 7,000 kilometer journey required Dench to think like a swan. So I have used the first quote already. I've used the second quote and I have reworded it. Let's see if we can link the third one. So the third quote is temperatures got really cold. So that's alluding to the, and it says later on about the weather conditions being quite uh, adverse. So let's put, to think like a swan, let's put all, all whilst, whilst having to, I'm going to put occasionally, because it doesn't say all the time, occasionally endure, let's put adverse weather conditions. And let's finish that off with during the audacious that means brave, audacious journey. Dench's journey to find out more about the Buick swans and their significant decline in numbers did not come without its challenges. 
Firstly, the 7,000 kilometer journey required Dench to think like a swan, all whilst having to occasionally endure adverse weather conditions during the audacious journey. Well, I didn't manage to link all four ideas together, but I've linked my first three quotes together using complex sentence structures. structures. And that's really what you want to try and do, because if you use lots of simple sentences, you are going to run out of words quite quickly. So now I need to try and link um, my fourth quote with the whole paramotor shaking with disturbing other migrating birds. Let's see if this works. By the way, I'm going to use additionally as my discourse marker. So additionally, given that Dench was in a, let's put flimsy motorized, I've already changed it to a Z, a motorized paraglider. Let's put, let's link the other idea. There was also the concern of, what's the quote again? Disturbing, disturbing. Okay, so in this case, so disturbing other migrating birds, I would imagine that Cambridge would not want you to use the word disturbing. So I'm going to use the synonym, un let's use unsettling. Flimsy motorized paraglider. There was also the concern of unsettling other birds or let's put potentially colliding into them. Does that work? I think it worked. So I'm now going to move on to using the discourse marker secondly. And I want to try, I think realistically, try and link six and seven together so the fact that Dench got quite attached to them as individuals, and this of course made the fact that losing one of them was particularly difficult on a sort of emotional level, I guess. So I'm going to put, secondly, a further challenge was the, let's use close bond, she soon formed with the swans, and then link to the next quote which is realized it had perished so i'm going to put which made which made losing a tagged swan um, let's put particularly let's put emotional does that work i think it does um secondly a further challenge challenge was a close bond she soon formed with the swans which made losing a tagged swan particularly emotional now, as mentioned, eight and nine are kind of like the odd ones out, so I can't really link them together, and that's absolutely fine. So I'm just going to use, um, let's use moreover. So moreover, that she met Russian school children who were sent out to shoot migrating birds for food. So it's sort of addressing their sort of attitude and behavior. So moreover, challenging the attitudes of Russian school children um, embedded clause who were taught to who were taught to shoot the birds let's just put was was another challenge by the way guys I've just realized I have not done any word count I hope this is just under or thereabouts. So lastly, we're just going to use that last quote. So quite straightforward. Lastly, let's just put time spent in hospital due to an injury. We don't really need to give the specifics. Proved, let's put proved particularly difficult for Dench. Let's read that before we do the word count. Dench's journey to find out more about the Buick swans and their significant decline in numbers did not come without its challenges. Firstly, the 7,000 kilometer journey required Dench to think like a swan, all whilst having to occasionally endure adverse weather conditions during the audacious journey. Additionally, given that Dench was in a flimsy motorized paraglider, there was also the concern of unsettling other birds or potentially colliding into them. Secondly, a further challenge was the close bond she soon formed with the swans, which made losing a tagged 
Swan particularly emotional. Moreover, challenging the attitudes of Russian school children who were taught to shoot the birds was another challenge. Lastly, time spent in hospital due to an injury proved particularly difficult for Dench. Let's do a word count. Oh, 122. 122, okay. Um, which may losing a tag swand. I'm just going to get rid of the particularly's proved. There we go, guys. Without even checking. Well, I've just checked the word count. Uh, 120 word summary. I think with summary writing, it really is sort of practice makes perfect. Hopefully you can kind of see the process. You know, I've rearranged the the ideas appropriately. I've used my own words. It's in the style of a summary. Um, practice past papers. Practice the summary, summary question because it can be easy as long as you are confident with the correct approach. Now moving on to the next set of the sub questions, the question two strands. I am flagging already. Of course, for these questions, we need to read text C, and that is titled uh, An Incredible Journey. For the first sub-questions, well, let me just read them out. So question two, you have to identify a word or phrase from the text which suggests the same idea as the words underlined. You will not find these sentences in the text. Yes, they link to what is going on, but they have been written for the purpose of you finding an appropriate word, phrase or synonym for these four sentences. I hope that made sense, by the way. I'm quite tired. So as mentioned, what is important to know is that a word or phrase, phrase is simply required and that word or phrase needs to be able to replace the word or phrase underline and for the um, for the sentence still to make sense. My goodness, I can't talk anymore. It's important that you do not copy out really lengthy sentences, even if it includes the correct word or phrase, because you will not get the mark. Again, these questions generally take you through the text, so expect the first answer to be early on. So for the first question or the first strand, Max and Helmuth had great hopes for their journey. When we read the text, we are, of course, looking for a synonym, a word or a phrase which has the same suggested meaning as great hopes. The second one uh, was very hot and strong. The third one overheated and made a high pitched noise. And the last one buried in deep and unhappy thoughts. But before we attempt the questions, let's read the text, the last text titled An Incredible Journey. Text C, An Incredible Journey. In 1935, two men, Max the narrator and Helmuth, tried to find a land route from India to China. Here, Max describes part of their journey from the Judean desert in the Middle East and across the River Jordan. We set off on our journey, on our journey, on our desert journey, the following day in good spirits. The full of high expectations, the car glided through the gorges of Judea over bubbling hot asphalt into a sign board in Arabic, Hebrew and English proclaimed the words sea level. The way descended another 400 metres and it was a peculiar feeling to know that all the water in the oceans of the world was towering above you like mountains. In front of us lay the leaden expanse of the Dead Sea. Was it true that it was impossible to sink in it? I tried for myself while Helmuth, sorry if I butchered that name by the way, looked on and smiled. You lie on the top of the water motionless like a cork. Swimming, in the conventional sense, is not possible, since hands and feet flail around in the air like useless paddles. According to the brochure, one could read a newspaper undisturbed or hold up a sunshade. A local photographer lurked nearby. However, reading a newspaper in comfort is just a publicity stunt. After only a few minutes, the salt begins to affect you. You itch and you burn in every pore, and I wanted nothing else than to get into the River Jordan double quick and rinse the salt crust off. Helmuth laughed as I urged him to put his foot down on the accelerator. That's something definitely my friends would do. Um, we crossed the Jordan by bridge. There, 
was where Asia really began. Sorry, this was where Asia really began. The track leading up out of the Dead Sea Depression along the slopes of Jordan Valley was stony and steep. We had to get over a high point of 1,200 meters in the mountains. The May sun blazed fiercely and the engine labored its way up into first gear. The radiator thermometer was already showing 90 degrees. This car is far too heavy, I eventually admitted. Helmuth nodded silently. I did warn you, Max. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see anxiety in his face and I bit my lip controlling an urge to point out that most of our luggage was his, packed lovingly by his mother before we started out. The overloaded car springs were groaning on the bumpy road. 100 degrees, the radiator boiled and whistled. I stopped the car. Helmuth dug out our map of Asia. Here's Palestine and there's China, he said. We've come about 400 kilometers so far and there are about 23,000 still to go. Whoa. We sat there for a long time, brooding side by side with a big map of Asia on our knees. We were both depressed, but understood the need not to let this turn into a recrimination. Our weight was at the root of our whole problem. We'll have to downsize, I said. We'll have to jettison some of our luggage. Helmuth nodded silently, staring at the boxes in the rear of the car. Maybe we can manage them as far as Baghdad. I offered, and they can be put into storage. Easier in our minds, we waited for darkness to fall before we drove on. Night journeys are not only cooler, but are beautiful in the east. Over the landscape arched a sky, sparkling with a plethora of stars. Along the rocks of the gorge huddled flocks of storks, shining like patches of snow as the light danced on their plumage. I wished I'd bought a better camera. The birds were not alarmed, being tired from their long journey. They had come from Sudan, and the next day they would fly onto their northern kingdom and the European springtime. A few of them raised their heads sleepily from their feathers and followed us with a long, serious gaze of philosophers. Perhaps they were thinking, funny these humans going south now. At eleven o'clock we gratefully pitched camp, sleeping on the camp beds in the open with the gentle warm breezes caressing our faces was wonderful. So remember, we are looking for a word or phrase to replace the phrase great hopes. And it is the first question, so no doubt we will be able to find the answer in paragraph one or certainly early on in the text. And I'm just going to quickly skim the text. And straight away there, hopefully you can see and full of high expectations. And I'm just going to highlight that full of high expectations, has the same meaning as great hopes. So I'm quickly going to identify the other answers and highlight them just to speed this video up a little bit. So of course the next strand, we were looking for a word or phrase to replace uh, was very hot and strong. So of course our answer is going to be blazed fiercely. The next strand um, is to find a word or phrase to replace overheated and made a high-pitched noise. So boiled and whistled fits in perfectly there. And the last one, which is perhaps slightly more challenging because you need to understand what brooding means, that of course replaces buried in deep un and unhappy thoughts as brooding quite literally means showing a deep unhappiness of thought. And fingers crossed, you should end up with something like this. No lengthy quotations. If you do that, you will get it wrong. Your word or phrase needs to be able to replace the word or phrase underlined. So for example, with the first one, Max and Helmuth had high expectations for that journey. That grammatically makes sense. The second one, the sun blazed fiercely. The third one, the radiator boiled and whistled. And the last one, Max and Helmuth were brooding. It's really important you understand the correct approach, otherwise you will be throwing away marks. Now for the next strands, guys, we are almost there. You have to, you have to explain the denotation or the meaning of three words. An appropriate synonym will do. Make sure, again, your chosen word makes sense within the sentence. I'm pretty sure um, the word needs to be the same word class as well. Hopefully, this shouldn't be too problematic. Even if you are unsure of 
the vocabulary, try and have an educated guess, try and read it within the given context. So the sentence is, our weight was at the root of our whole problem, we'll have to downsize, I said, we'll have to jettison some of our luggage. Now, even if you didn't know what jettison means, hopefully you can give it a good shot just from knowing the situation that both men are in. So, of course, root is the cause or the core or the center of a problem within the context of this sentence. So, quite simply, I'm just going to go with center and I'm just going to write that down here. Now, again, notice how the sentence still makes sense and the meaning hasn't changed. So, I could read the sentence as our weight was at the center of our whole problem. It still makes sense. And whole, I think the obvious example is simply just to put entire. And again, it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence. Our weight was at the center of our entire problem. It still makes sense. So as mentioned, if you didn't know what sort of jettison meant, hopefully you can give it a good educated guess just from knowing their situation. However, FYI, jettison is a verb to denote getting rid of something. So I mean, get rid of, discard, leave behind, I'm sure would all be acceptable synonyms. I'm just going to use one word and I'm just going to put discard. Let's just read the whole sentence with our new synonyms. Our weight was at the center of our entire problem. We'll have to downsize, I said. We'll have to discard some of our luggage. Three easy marks. Don't get it wrong. Which brings us on to our last newer question. Now, there's no harm in treating this question as, I guess, a mini watered down writer's effect question. Put simply, you need to choose one example here and link it to whatever the focus is. So the focus of this question um, relates to the feelings of the men, how they feel about camping, and I guess being one with nature. It's always best to choose an image you are most confident with in terms of saying three different things. You don't want to be repeating yourself. And avoid using words from the quotation. You have to use your own words that is clearly stated in the question. So I have just highlighted the quote or the image that I am going to use and that is the gentle warm breezes caressing our faces. And I always tell my students to write this quote first and then analyze underneath just to keep them really focused on that image and so they don't analyze other things outside of that image because remember one example only now hopefully from this image you can see that max and how must can finally relax it's almost as if they have been rewarded for their efforts it has been a tiring day also, the way the breeze has been uh, depicted or conveyed is also quite interesting. This is a kind of soothing and comforting quality um, in an almost affectionate way. So I'm going to try and get those ideas down into a mini paragraph. So I have quite simply put the quotation first, followed by, I guess, my analysis. And that reads, the writer's image here makes it seem as though Max and Hal must have finally been rewarded for their efforts. The breeze is depicted as having a soothing and comforting quality to it, almost as if it's brushing their face in an affectionate, motherly way, allowing both men to finally relax after what has been a long and tiring day. And that surely would be enough to secure those three marks. Now, of course, the second core question comes next, commonly referred to as the writer's effect question. It's worth 50 marks and it's all about, I guess, showing an awareness as to how language works. You need to select three powerful images from each paragraph you are directed to and you need to explain the effect of your chosen images. You need to analyze them. I do recommend you adopt a continuous prose approach even though it's 15 marks for reading, as writing in, I guess, what would be commonly referred to as an essay style will allow you to explore your images in depth and consider them within, 
I guess they're given context. And if you've watched my previous videos on this this particular question, you'll know I advise my students to use a five-step method. I'll try and explain this as I go, but a few important things to note. Don't forget to highlight your images, identify the overall effect of the language, i.e. what the writer is trying to achieve. Be sure to take note of the information given in the question. More on this in a minute. And try and say two things per image. And don't worry about going over the word count. Timing is more important. You want to spend about 30 minutes on this question, 15 minutes per paragraph. And I will summarize timings at the end. And with all that being said, let's read the question. So we are directed to reread paragraphs 2 and 14. Paragraph 2 begins in front of us lay in front of us lay and is about Max's expectations and experience in the Dead Sea. Paragraph 14 begins easier in our mind and is about Max and Helmuth, what they see while driving in the evening. And then you've got the typical writer's effect wording and instructions at the bottom. Now going back to what I said before, you really want to take note of the information that is given after the ellipsis. Focus on this and only this and this information is really crucial because it will help you write your topic sentence and it will make sure your paragraphs are focused. So I'm just going to highlight them now. You know that your first writer's effect paragraph is going to be all about Max's expectations and I guess the reality of trying to swim in the Dead Sea and your second writer's effect paragraph is all about what Max and Helmuth see while driving in the evening. Do not stray away from the two focuses you are given. So I'm just going to read each of the paragraphs again. So the first paragraph we are directed to reads, In front of us lay the leaden expanse of the Dead Sea. Was it true that it was impossible to sink in it? I tried for myself while Helmuth looked on and smiled. You lie on top of the water, motionless like a cork. Swimming in the conventional sense is not possible, since hands and feet flail around in the air like useless paddles. According to the brochures, one could read a newspaper undisturbed or hold up a sunshade. A local photographer lurked nearby. Now hopefully you can see that Max's experience is a, a rather comedic or humorous one. Of course his expectation, I guess, was being able to swim easily in the Dead Sea. This obviously makes the whole scene quite humorous because he has no control of his limbs, his arms and legs are kind of flailing ar around. And this kind of idealised image of just being completely undisturbed is nonsense really because of the local photographer lurking nearby which is a little bit unsettling and I don't know about you, I wouldn't find that necessarily very comforting or very peaceful knowing that my photograph was about to be taken with my legs and arms all over the place. So I've already highlighted three images which kind of link to what I've just said before and that seems to be the overall effect that the writer is trying to create this almost comedic scene. I've gone with the fact that you lie on the top of the water motion, motionless like a cork, um, his hands and feet flared around in the air like useless paddles and this, this really idealised image that apparently you can read a newspaper undisturbed or hold up a sunshade. So now I'm going to copy and paste these quotations and show you how to write a good writer's effect paragraph. So I've got my three quotations and that's really all I need. I'm going to try and do this as quickly as possible. Those of you who have watched my videos, you'll, you'll know that step one is establishing or writing a clear and concise sentence, our topic sentence, and that starts with the overall effect of the language. So I'm just going to start uh, writing response and I'm going to talk you through it. So step one is writing the overall effect. And we can simply put the overall effect of the language creates an image image off and that sort of sentence starter does not change for each paragraph um, so the overall effect of the language creates an image of the let's put creates a I'm going to put comedic image of Max struggling 
struggling to swim in the dead sea. Let's keep it nice and simple. The overall effect of the language creates a comedic image of Matt struggling to swim in the dead sea. And the next step is to use what I call a transition phrase. So ensuring that we get from the overall effect to our next idea smoothly. And quite simply, we use the writer begins by and then we use our first quotation. So the writer begins by describing Max as... Now I get my students to write using literary present and that just means that your verb choices, you change them to present tense. You don't have to do this, but it's good practice. My students do literature, so I do prefer them to, to embed their quotation. So I'm going to put Max as let's put and then we put that in square brackets lying on top of the water motionless like a cork and there is our first image the next step is to use what we call the zoom in technique so we are going to start with the writer's use of you can put imagery or you can be more specific it's of course a simile here so i'm going to put simile the writer's use of the simile here is particularly effective try and get in that evaluative voice so when you say things such as this is powerful this is this is uh you know humorous this is striking etc cambridge really like that so it's particularly effective as it creates an image of max let's put effortlessly Quite literally, he's bobbing up and down without the need to make any movements himself. So you've got this almost sort of contrast, but it's clear that he is unable to... He's, he's sort of, he's floating because of the density, isn't he? So let's put fight the density of the dead sea. And I think that would be enough for our first image. We've got two things there. Then we use our next transition phrase, which is simply the writer then goes on, goes on to describe, the writer goes on. So Max's hands and feet as being, hands and feet? Hands and feet as being like useless, paddles and there is our embedded quotation and then we are going to use the zoom in technique so quite simply the writer's use of imagery imagery here creates a let's put humorous image of max's limbs being let's put redundant they are clearly little use when it comes to helping propel him forward. And then our last transition phrase is simply, lastly, the writer then goes on to describe. So the quote is, read a newspaper undisturbed or hold up a sunshade. So lastly, the writer then goes on to describe Let's put one being a, because it's not necessarily about any specific person, one being able to read a newspaper undisturbed or hold up a sun. And of course, this is where we kind of want to mention that this is a kind of ridiculous image. It's very idealized. It contrasts with the the reality. So first of all, we are going to use the zoom in technique. So we're just going to put the writer's use of imagery here is, let's put, particularly amusing as it creates an idealized image of what it is like to experience the Dead Sea. 
And then of course it sort of contrasts with the reality. So let's put, of course, this contrast with the reality. There are no doubt other tourists around and with the annoying, let's use, what was that quote again? Let's use another quote just because it supports my point and you are perfectly able to do this. So there are no doubt other tourists around and with the annoying lurking, I think presence, I think is a quote of a photographer being able to relax seems almost impossible. I'm just going to add something else which has just sprung to my mind to add let's put what the what the brochure depicts simply seems like a ploy slash marketing gimmick to get more people visiting. There we go guys, a paragraph which kind of follows those five steps. Um, I wouldn't say this paragraph is ne necessarily full of images or, or obvious images, so just be aware of that. I think the second paragraph certainly has more images that are a lot more obvious, but I'm just going to read this out. The overall effect of the language creates a comedic image of Max struggling to swim in the Dead Sea. The writer begins by describing Max as lying on top of the water, motionless like a cork. The writer's use of the simile here is particularly effective as it creates an image of Max effortlessly bobbing up and down without the need to make any movements himself. It's clear that he is unable to fight the density of the Dead Sea. The writer then goes on to describe Max's hands and feet as being like useless paddles. The writer's use of imagery here creates a humorous image of Max's limbs being redundant. They are clearly little use when it comes to helping propel him forward. Lastly, the writer then goes on to describe one being able to read a newspaper undisturbed or hauled up a sunshade. The writer's use of imagery here is particularly amusing as it creates an idealised image of what it is like to experience the Dead Sea. Of course, this contrasts with the reality. There are no doubt other tourists around and with the annoying lurking presence of a photographer, being able to relax seems almost impossible. To add, what the brochure depicts simply seems like a ploy marketing gimmick to get more people visiting. And I think that would be enough. Now, paragraph 14 is about what Max and Helmuth see while driving in the evening. So let's take another read. Easier in our minds, we waited for darkness to fall before we drove on. Night journeys are not only cooler, but are beautiful in the east. Over the landscape arched a sky, sparkling with a plethora of stars. Along the rocks of the gorge huddled flocks of storks, shining like patches of snow as the light danced on their plumage. I just wish I'd brought a better camera. The birds were not alarmed, being tired from their long journey. They had come from the Sudan. The next day they were flying to their northern kingdom in the European springtime. A few of them raised their heads sleepily from their feathers and followed us, followed us with a long serious gaze of philosophers. Perhaps they were thinking, funny these humans going south just now. Now hopefully you can see that driving in the east at night almost has this sort of magical otherworldly quality to it. It seems idealistic, romanticised, whatever adjective you want to use. Cambridge love texts like these ones. No, momentarily it almost seems too good to be true and something disastrous happens. Anyway, I digress. So I'm now going to, and I will take you through this process, I'm going to highlight three quotes. And I think my first one is going to be the fact that they wait until darkness to fall before they drive on. Although it's not necessarily an obvious image, Perhaps there's this sense of adventure. Um, perhaps they are going to, I guess, experience something unique in the darkness. My second quote has to be this lovely grand image of the landscape. Sorry, uh, over the landscape, arched a sky sparkling with a plethora of stars. What a lovely image there. 
again, it's almost as if this sort of landscape, this world that they are in, it's it's magical, it's ethereal. I want to be there, and I definitely do not enjoy camping. And I think my last image has to be something about the storks. So there's that beautiful image of the light dancing. Where is it now? So the shining, uh, the, the light dancing on their plumage, on their feathers. That is going to be my next one. And I guess I could explore the sort of the night sky and the contrast with the colours. I think that would work quite well. And of course, this image highlights their beauty and it, it just fits in perfectly with the, the, lands, the landscape and the starry sky. So I'm going to repeat the process. I'm going to copy and paste these quotations onto my Word doc and then I'm going to follow the five steps and try and do this as quickly as possible because I have a little bit left in the tank and I need some energy for that mammoth, that Herculean task, question three. So I've just pasted my three quotations onto my document and remember we start with step one and that is writing a clear and concise sentence which links to the overall effect of the language and I'm just going to start writing straight away. I am flagging a little bit. <laughs> the overall effect of the language creates an image of Max and Thelma's experience of driving in the east at night. I'm just going to probably put magical experience. Let's also put the nighttime scene is depicted as being both captivating and romanticized one that leaves them in complete awe. And what you'll find with your overall effect is that you'll have at least one adjective or one abstract noun or a series of adjectives as long as it's nice and focused and it links to the images that you are going to explore. So in the case of uh, this paragraph, I've started my paragraph with the overall effect of the language creates an image of Max and Helmers' magical experience of driving in the east at night. The nighttime scene is depicted as being both captivating and romanticized, one that leaves them incomplete, or I think that covers all bases, perhaps a little bit too lengthy. And I've just realized that I spelled one of the main characters' names wrong, Helmuth. I thought it sounded weird when I was saying it. Anyway, uh, let's start with the first transition phrase, which of course is going to be the writer begins by describing Max and Helmuth's, what is the quote, waiting for darkness to fall. So the writer begins by describing Max and Helmuth, let's use literary present, waiting for for darkness to fall and there is our embedded quotation and then of course we're going to use the zoom in technique so quite simply we are going to put the writer's use of imagery here is effective as it immediately let's put creates a sense of adventure and excitement. We need to develop that a little bit more. So let's put the fact that they are waiting for it to be dark. Perhaps let's put anticipates that they will have an intimate an intimate experience of the natural world and the surrounding, this is where I get really carried, uh, carried away, and the surrounding landscape without any disturbance from, let's put other, other tourists. By the way, 
If you've not noticed already, I am rubbish at typing. I used to be really good. I don't know what happened. So the second quotation is landscape arched a sky, landscape arched a sky sparkling with a plethora of stars, a really grand and beautiful image there. So let's use our transition phrase. So the writer then goes on to describe the landscape. Let's use literary present. Arching a sky sparkling with a plethora, so that means a lot, of stars. And there is our second embedded quotation. And then we are going to zoom in again. The writer's use of imagery here is particularly striking. Why is it? It's striking because it creates, let's put particularly striking as it creates, creates a grand image of the landscape being, let's put spectacularly lit up by an abundance. So I'm not using the same word plethora by an abundance of stars. I'm going to develop it a little bit more. Feel free to say more than two things, by the way. Um, you know, the core of this question is language anal analysis. So it's really about exploring those different shades of meaning. So additionally, it creates an almost enchanting and ethereal world one which is incredibly inviting there we have it so our last quote is light dancing on their plumage so on their feathers so we are going to use our transition phrase so lastly the writer goes on to describe the this paragraph is much easier by the way in terms of the the images it contains the and you get that sometimes light dancing literary present on the we want to change there so let's put let's put on the stalks on the stalks plumage that is my cat meowing to get inside but i'm going to finish this first and then we are going to zoom in so the writer's use of let's call it personification you can you can just refer to it as imagery throughout that's absolutely fine but if you want to be a bit more specific providing your analysis is decent um it's going to look far more impressive of course the light is being personified here so the writer's use of personification here creates an image of the reflected light providing it's almost as if, it, as if it's providing this sort of i guess artistic show so let's put providing providing an Im impressive and almost artistic show it's as if they are in a fantasy where the natural world is left completely undisturbed and i just want to add something about something a bit more explicitly linked to the colors so i'm just going to put to add the fact that the light is illuminating the stalks feathers also also creates an image of their beauty which of course as mentioned before which fits in perfectly with the let's put mesmerizing landscape um the focus on the stalks color 
also seems to contrast in a weird way harmoniously with the night sky. Everything just sort of pieces together so beautifully. And I think that would be enough. Let's just take a read. The overall effect of the language creates an image of Max and Helmuth's magical experience of driving in the east at night. The nighttime scene is depicted as being both captivating and romanticized, one that leaves them in complete awe. The writer begins by describing Max and Helmuth waiting for darkness to fall. The writer's use of imagery here is effective as it immediately creates a sense of adventure and excitement. The fact that they are waiting for it to be dark perhaps anticipates that they will have an intimate experience of the natural world and the surrounding landscape without any disturbance from other tourists. The writer then goes on to describe the landscape arching the sky, sparkling with a plethora of sky stars. The writer's use of imagery here is particularly striking as it creates a grand image of the landscape being spectacularly lit up by an abundance of stars. Additionally, it creates an almost enchanting and ethereal world, one which is incredibly inviting. Lastly, the writer goes on to describe the light dancing on the stork's plumage. The writer's use of personification here creates an image of the reflected light provide, providing an impressive and almost artistic show. It's as if they are in a fantasy where the natural world is left completely undisturbed. Not sure if I like that, but let's move on. To add, the fact that the light is illuminating the stork's feathers also creates an image of their beauty, which fits in perfectly with the mesmerizing landscape. The focus on the stork's color also seems to contrast harmoniously with the night sky. And there you have it, a top band writer's effect question. Now moving on to question three. This is where most students start flagging and I'm feeling the strain as well. I really feel for you guys. I'm pretty sure I said that in my previous walkthrough. There's a lot of content to get through. Timing is so, so important. Timing and planning. It is the last question. It's a core cool question. It's worth 25 marks. This really can make or break your grade. Essentially for this question, you are being assessed on your ability to use a range of ideas from the text and transform those ideas into the style of whatever text type you are given. Remember, there are seven text types. Let's take a look at the question. So question three, imagine you are Helmuth from text C. Straight off the evening that you and Max pitch camp, you write a letter to your mother. In your letter, you should comment on the most enjoyable parts of your journey so far and why they were enjoyable, the challenges you and Max faced and how you overcame these challenges, the problems you foresee for the rest of the trip and how might you have been better prepared for them. Now, just from reading that question straight away, I can foresee a problem for some students who perhaps don't read text closely enough. Of course, the original text is told from Max's point of view and you are being asked to write an informal letter from Helmuth's point of view Quite often Cambridge do this, so close reading is really key. Now, given that the task is an informal letter and the audience is your mother, you really need to adopt and sustain a suitable style and voice throughout. And I'll talk more about this as I write the letter and how you can achieve this. Lastly, there are 15 marks for reading, so it's imperative that you select a range of ideas. Don't lose sleep if you don't highlight five things for each paragraph. What is important is that you develop some of your ideas and there is a range to show a thorough understanding of the text. And again, more on this a little bit later on. With all that said, I'm now going to highlight, try and highlight five pieces of evidence for my first bullet point just to speed things up a little bit. If you do have time to reread the text, I do recommend you do that. However, skimming and scanning skills are really crucial for the first language, paper one. Because put simply, you just don't have the time to keep rereading and rereading text again and again. Sorry, and one more thing. You'll notice that each bullet point also has two strands. And again, this is something which Cambridge like to do quite frequently. In a way, this makes things easier. The second strand to each bullet point, of course, is where you infer, it's where you develop relevantly with your own ideas. So you don't have to think about how to develop your ideas necessarily. You are 
being told you need to explore why those parts of the, of the journey were enjoyable. So it's almost a bit of extra help actually. So again, I've just highlighted five ideas just to speed this video up a little bit. Of course, the first idea may well be that Helmuth perhaps enjoy driving down to the lowest point on Earth is quite a unique experience. The second one, we can look at the, the view of the Dead Sea. Linking to that, of course, is Max's very comedic, humorous attempts at trying to swim in the Dead Sea. Obviously, as well, Helmuth very much enjoyed his friend Max being in discomfort due to going in the Dead Sea. A little bit sadistic, if you ask me. And lastly, I've chosen um, j just being underneath the stars and camping. Uh, both men seem to very much enjoy that. So I'm just going to paste these quotations onto my document and show you how to transform them into the style of an informal letter. Remember, like other questions, you should not be lifting phrases from the original text. And something which I didn't mention was that the advice I generally give my students is to write a mini introductory paragraph to, I guess, establish a clear sense of audience and purpose. So ultimately, you'll end up with four paragraphs, a mini introduction, and then a paragraph for each bullet point. Obviously, if you are asked to write a formal report or a newspaper report, um, how it looks on paper may well be slightly different. So this is what I mean by a kind of introduction or introductory paragraph, just to help you establish a sense of character or voice. And I'm just going to read this out. Dear Mother, I hope this letter reaches you well. It's evening here and we've finally settled for the night under the starry sky. It truly is mesmerising here. You would love it. I'm just looking at my surroundings as I write this and I can't believe we've made it this far. The journey's been immeasurably tough for the both of us. However, it's not been all doom and gloom. Of course, we've had some fun along the way. So clearly it's got that sort of affectionate, informal, chatty style. And if you are given a task similar, you want to think about ways in which you can achieve this. Of course, in terms of stylistic features, you should consciously try and include rhetorical questions, emotive language, those kind of things can really help you uh, create a suitable voice. So I'm going to type my first paragraph addressing the first bullet point and the first quotation I'm going to explore is sea level the way descended another 400 meters. So watch how I do this. So I'm going to start with a stylistic choice and that's going to be a rhetorical question so let's put where do I even begin our let's put Herculean and think about your vocabulary as well what vocabulary choices can you use to impress Cambridge so our Herculean journey began with us driving through the in desert it was let's put it was exciting yet strange to think that we were heading to the lowest point this is where I am rewording quotation one take note the lowest point on earth, the Dead Sea. And you want to think about how you can develop appropriately, how you can convey the, the emotions of the speaker. So I'm going to put, whilst I initially felt uneasy, as anyone would, I think, whilst I initially felt uneasy, knowing that we were at least at least 
what's 400 meters right 400 meters below sea level it was let's put dare i say it somewhat somewhat of an let's put let's put adrenaline rush okay little things like that you know don't be afraid to sort of break conventions of grammar you know how i've used those hyphens stylistically there um, whilst I, I initially felt uneasy knowing that we were at least 400 meters below sea level, it was, dare I say it, somewhat of an adrenaline rush. Okay, trying to get those reading marks as well as those writing marks. Now I want to explore the expanse of the Dead Sea, I guess, his initial first impression. So when I was. Let's put when I was greeted by the dead my first thoughts were let's put wow this is simply incredible. And I want to mention, obviously, the expanse explicitly. So I'm going to put, let's just put, it just seemed to stretch, stretch as far as the eye could see. And that quotation has been reworded successfully. Now I want to move on to the third quotation. So let's put, of course, Max's first instinct was to get in and to see if it really did, let's put, live up to the hype. Did he float? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, that is called hyperphora, by the way. It kind of looks like a rhetorical question. Hyperphora is where you, um, you, you write a question and then you answer it immediately. And again, it's a stylistic choice that perhaps we would see in sort of journal entries, article, uh, magazine articles, letters, etc. Now, you need to be careful here because you need to address the second strand um, for at least a couple or a few of the quotations. So what was enjoyable about that? Well, it was a whole sort of comedic element to it. So I'm going to put my enjoyment came from his, let's put, unfruitful, unfruitful attempts of trying to swim. It was incredibly amusing to say the very least. He just bobbed up and down. He just bobbed up and down. Let's put desperately trying to thrash his legs and arms around to no avail. <laughs> he wasn't able to swim in a conventional way, I guess. So our next idea is the fact that Helmuth laughed as I urged him to put his foot down on the accelerator. So I want to include that. When I was reading this, I kind of thought, you know, if I was Helmuth, I would want to experience the Dead Sea, regardless of whether it irritated my skin. So I'm going to try and include that in my letter and see how I do this. And again, this is just a kind of uh, stylistic choice um, to kind of create that authentic voice. So I'm going to put, I know what you are thinking, Helmuth. Why did you, <laughs> why did you miss an opportunity to experience Swimming in the Dead Sea. And then I'm going to put, well, 
linking to the sort of linking to quote for well i'm quite glad this was an opportunity i missed why because obviously max's skin was irritated by the salt so i'm just going to put max moaning about his skin being irritated by the salt sue moaning about his skin being irritated by the salt and i'm just going to put i couldn't because cambridge love a semicolon we all know that i couldn't help but snigger just a little bit and i'm pretty sure i called helmuth sadistic he drives intentionally slow i mean what kind of friend is that so i'm also going to put um let's put perhaps perhaps i was even guilty of driving slower than usual yes i can be cruel <laughs> so hopefully you can see yes i am kind of developing them a lot you have 40 minutes so use that time if you go over the word count that's absolutely fine um as long as you develop some of the ideas you don't need to develop every single one um moving on to my last quotation sparkling with a plethora of stars um let's put to Tonight has really made everything worth it. I'm just looking at the sky as I write this. Let's put we are camping outside the stars. Remember, we mustn't use the words from the quotation. And, you know, some students perhaps would put you know, the stars are sparkling. There's a, a plethora of stars. You need to use appropriate synonyms. So we are camping outside. The stars are, let's put, beautifully illuminating the landscape. There are, let's mention the birds. There are even flocks of storks peacefully resting. How to end this paragraph? Let's put maybe, just maybe, this is a sign that we will get to our final destination in one piece. Here's hoping. And let's just read that paragraph again. So where do I even begin? Our Herculean journey began with us driving through the Judean desert. It was exciting yet strange to think that we, that we were heading to the lowest point on earth, the Dead Sea. Whilst I initially felt uneasy knowing that we were at least 400 metres below sea level, it was, dare I say it, somewhat of an adrenaline rush. When I was greeted by the Dead Sea, my first thought, power of proofreading, my first thoughts were, wow, this is simply incredible. It just seems to stretch as far as the eye could see. Of course, Max's first instinct was to get in and to see if it really did live up to the hype. Did he float? Oh, yes. My enjoyment came from his unfruitful attempts of trying to swim. It was incredibly amusing to say the very least. He just bobbed up and down, desperately trying to thrash his legs and arms around to no avail. I know what you're thinking, Helmuth, why did you miss an opportunity to experience swimming in the Dead Sea? Well, I'm quite glad this was an opportunity I missed. Max was soon moaning about his skin being irritated by the salt. I couldn't help but snigger just a little bit. Perhaps I was even guilty of driving slower than usual. Yes, I can be cruel. Tonight has really made everything worth it. I'm just looking at the stars, just looking at the sky as I write this. We are camping outside, the stars are beautifully illuminating the landscape. There are even flocks of storks peacefully resting. Maybe, just maybe, this is a sign that we will get to our final destination in one piece. Now hopefully that makes sense, that process makes sense. And yes, as mentioned, I do realise a word count. Warriors will be waving their arms frantically. I have tried to develop each idea 
As long as there's some development, you will be fine. Remember, despite what some teachers are telling you, you will not get penalized for going over the word count. What is more important is the timing. I recommend 40 minutes on this question. And moving on to the second bullet point, we are looking at the challenges Helmuth and Max faced and how they overcame these challenges. So that's obviously where you are probably going to have to infer. It won't always be clearly stated in the text. You will have to provide suitable and sen sensible inferences based on what you have read. So, of course, if we look here, we've got what is very much a bumpy and steep terrain. And, of course, we could develop this by saying that they had to drive extra slow uh, and that would i guess address the second strand so that's certainly the first idea i am going to use and i'm going to highlight four others just to speed the video up a little bit more so i have highlighted three other quotations so that's four and that's absolutely fine my second idea is the sun blazing fiercely of course, the scorching hot weather is going to be problematic, and I guess a, I guess how they overcame the 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 heat, the oppressive heat, was to make that conscious decision to continue the drive at night. Um, we were both depressed. There's also this palpable tension between the two. They are both described as being miserable. Uh, so perhaps we can say that Helmuth decided to keep quiet, um, to not make things worse. And then my last idea, of course, it has to be something about the luggage. And of course, in terms of overcoming this challenge, they say in the text they are going to have to get rid of some luggage. Otherwise, the, the car is surely going to break down. So again, just like before, I'm going to paste these onto my document and begin writing. So in this paragraph, obviously, I mention all of the doom and gloom. So I'm just going to get s stuck into it straight away. So let's put, however, as mentioned, it has been difficult at points. Um, rhetorical question. Everyone loves a rhetorical question. Are you ready for the doom and gloom not to worry mother or anything but they deserve to know the truth um after let's put after max's little adventure in the dead sea we set off along the slopes of the i think it was a jordan valley yes my Anxiety levels went through the roof at this. So little expressions, little, little sort of idiomatic uh, expressions will help you sort of create that uh, informal voice, which you would expect to see in an informal letter. Saying your anxiety levels went through the roof is terribly informal and you wouldn't include that, say, in a formal letter. And of course, his anxiety went through the roof because of the terrain being stony and steep. So let's put the terrain after crossing, crossing the bridge was, let's put, quite daunting. We went from being at the lowest point to what in my mind seemed like the highest point of I uh, can't remember what it was I think 1200 meters to be exact slight hyperbole there it was a bumpy ride and the let's mention the car struggling it was a bumpy ride and the car and the car let's put certainly struggled 
with the steep incline it was not exactly the most enjoyable part of our adventure so as you can see i am developing each idea appropriately let's mention the weather next so the weather was also let's put excruciatingly hot hot enough for us to decide to wait until night fell okay so we are we are or i'm trying to address that second strand there at this point let's put we were both just exhausted and the tension let's put the tension between us was palpable why because of the blinking luggage let's put sh 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 sh. it didn't it didn't help that it had been a long day and the sinking reality I can't type sinking reality was that we still had a long journey ahead of us okay and then I'm just going to move on to my fourth point which of course is the luggage which is just causing everyone problems of course let's put of course the car situation was not helped due to the amount of luggage we had taken ps thanks mom <laughs> a bit of bitter sarcasm there never hurt anyone um ch -ch -ch -ch. max wasn't impressed um let's put i to address a second strand i reluctant i reluctantly agree to get rid of some of it we will try and keep it with us for as long as possible do not worry. Okay. Despite the random gaps and some odd spellings, um, I think that is enough. Let's just quickly read it out. However, as mentioned, it has been difficult at points. Are you ready for the doom and gloom? After Max's little adventure in the Dead Sea, we set up along the slopes of the Jordan Valley. Yes, my anxiety levels went through the roof at this point. The terrain after crossing the bridge was quite daunting. We went from being at the lowest point to what in my mind seemed like the highest point of Earth, 1,200 metres to be exact. It was a bumpy ride and the car certainly struggled with a steep incline. It was not exact, exactly the most enjoyable part of our adventure. The weather was also excruciatingly hot, hot enough for us to decide to wait until night fell before let's put continuing with our journey at this point we were both just exhausted and the tension between us was palpable it didn't help that it had been a long day and the sinking reality was that we still had a long journey ahead of us of course the car situation was not helped due to the amount of luggage we had taken p.s thanks mum max wasn't impressed I reluctantly agree to get rid of some of it. We will try and keep it with us for as long as possible. Do not worry. Now, bullet point three, which reads the problems you foresee for the rest of the trip and how you might have been better prepared for them. Now, I'm sure your teachers have told you this already, but just in case you're unaware, bullet point three can be quite tricky. Evidence isn't as always obvious and you will find yourself having to infer a lot more 
and I guess consider the characters' whole situations, their their, their sort of emotions, etc. And just from that bullet point, the problems you foresee straight away, I know this is going to require far more inferential skills. Now, without even having to read the text, one glaringly obvious problem is that they still have a long way to go until they reach Baghdad. What could happen? Well, given the current state of the car, which of course is exacerbated by the heavy luggage, they could perhaps break down, perhaps... Perhaps they should have maybe familiarised themselves with this big map of Asia that they have. So in other words, where is the closest place where they can get help, a garage, some assistance? So I'm simply going to highlight 23,000 kilometres still to go. And of course the luggage, the luggage, the luggage, the luggage, that is problematic. Do they simply dump it? What could they have done differently? Well, perhaps Helmuth could have packed his own bags, you know, like most grown adults, or at least had a conversation with his mother. And again, they are both depressed. Are we anticipating or is there the possibility of a full-blown argument happening? Maybe, I think it's imminent. On a slightly lighter note, he says... I wish I'd bought a better camera. So maybe they could have invested together in a slightly more uh, expensive camera. Although this does seem like the least of their worries at the moment, but it's certainly something we could include in our response. And lastly, whilst they are momentarily in this blissful state, staring up at the starry sky, Maybe this will eventually wear off and they will be longing for the comforts of home for 21st century luxuries, a hotel, fresh linen, <laughs> who knows. So let's paste these quotations onto my Word doc and let's begin the last paragraph. <laughs> you can tell my energy is just at zero, it really is. Right, let's do this. So... I'm now trying to think about the rest of our journey. We've still got a long way to go. I'm just hoping that we don't run into any more problems. Here is hoping. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong um let's put well this sort of weird chatty style um you do you um well if i put my sensible hat on for a moment probably a lot and i anticipate a lot happening i wish i could read the rest of the text <laughs> The first thing is that we might not even get to Baghdad. Let's mention the car. The car has struggled with the current terrain and I can only imagine that that we are going to have to go even more of the beaten track. Let's address the second strand. So part of me wishes we were at least at least a little little bit familiar with the root, but one would argue where's the fun in that. So I'm going to mention the luggage, I think. So if we don't get rid of some of the heavier luggage, it almost seems imminent 
that our car is going to break down. And that's the last thing that we need. Let's put, of course, I am not simply prepared to, of course, I'm not, let's change the syntax. Of course, I am not prepared to simply dump my belongings. However, however, I know the situation with the luggage is causing friction between us both. Now, again, I just want to stress the importance of using your own words. If, say, for example, um, you wrote, we need to jettison some of our luggage, you would not get marked for that, or you might even get marked down, actually. Use your own words. And let's allude to the tension Let's put, well, let's develop. I am slightly concerned that one of us is going to boil over. Notice the sort of expressions that I use. You wouldn't use boil over in a formal letter. So boil over, of course, would be appropriate for this type of letter. So one of us is going to boil over. And let's put leaving us to call it a day on our trip. I don't think I am ready to surrender just yet. What could they have done about the luggage situation? Um, let's put perhaps in hindsight, because they say hindsight is 2020, perhaps in let's spell it correctly, perhaps in hindsight, we could have researched local storage facilities. Or perhaps next time I will pack my own bags. No offense, mother. I am truly grateful. And let's mention the camera. So on a slightly lighter note, the camera we have probably won't last much longer either. We aren't having the best of luck, are we? Notice how, again, I'm, you know, using these sort of stylistic choices to show an awareness of audience and purpose. And you should kind of, I guess, pepper them throughout. We aren't having the best of luck, are we? Kind of creates that relationship with your reader, in this case, mother and son, I guess. And I am going to explore the last bullet point. So I'm going to put the pessimistic the pessimistic side to me is also worried that eventually the magical quality of being outside and being one with nature will wear off. Yes, it's a beautifully, it's a beautiful night and the stars are out and I am very much enjoying camping outside with Max but I do capitals but I do wonder if I'm going to be longing for a nice hotel room with fresh linen I don't know if this idea is slightly ridiculous, but I'm putting it anyway. Uh, a nice hotel room with fresh linen. This would probably be me. Perhaps I should have done my homework. Who knows? And then of course we need to close the letter 
with an appropriate closing. So I'm just going to put, it's an informal letter. Anyway, I'll keep you posted. Do not worry about me, which is of course going to be very difficult for this mom in question. Love, Helmuth. Let's just read this final paragraph. It was done very quickly. Um, I'm now trying to think about the rest of our journey. We've still got a long way to go. I'm just hoping that we don't run into any more problems. What could possibly go wrong? Well, if I put my sensible hat on for a moment, probably a lot. The first thing is that we might not even get to Baghdad. The car has struggled with the current terrain and I can only imagine that we are going to have to go even more of the beaten track. Part of me wishes we were at least a little bit familiar with the route, but one would argue, where's the fun in that? If we don't get rid of some of the heavier luggage, it almost seems imminent that our car is going to break down and that's the last thing that we need. Of course, I'm not prepared to simply dump my belongings. However, I know the situation with the luggage is causing friction between us both. I'm slightly concerned that one of us is going to boil over, leaving us to call it a day on our trip. I don't think I'm ready to surrender just yet. Perhaps in hindsight, we could have researched local storage facilities. Not sure if I like that, but whatever. Or perhaps next time I will pack my own bags. No offense, mother, I am truly grateful. On a slightly lighter note, the camera we have probably won't last much longer either. We aren't, we aren't, we aren't having the best of luck, are we? The pessimistic side to me is also worried that eventually the magical quality of being outside and being one with nature will wear off. Yes, it's a beautiful night and the stars are out and I'm very much enjoying camping outside with Max, but I do wonder if I'm going to be longing for a nice hotel room with fresh linen soon. Perhaps I should have done my homework. Who knows? Anyway, I'll keep you posted. Do not worry about me. Love, Helmuth. And there you have it guys, a full extended writing response, a full walkthrough for paper one. paper one. Guys, I really don't know how you do it. I know I've said it about five times in this video. I have literally nothing left in the tank. Um, the last thing I want to say is timings. These are rough estimates and they include or should include reading and proof uh, reading. So for all of the, the newer questions, the smaller questions, the strand questions, whatever you want to call them, I recommend spending 30 minutes on those questions. For the first core question, the summary, 20 minutes I think is enough. The writer's effect question, 30 minutes. And for the extended response, the question that I've just completed, 40 minutes. And that should if I've done the maths correctly, be two hours. Guys, I hope this has been useful. Best of luck if you are sitting your exams in the May, June 2021 series. If any of my students have made it until the very, very end, I am rooting for you. Please do drop me an email if you need help. Um, best of luck to all of you and I will see you again very, very soon.